If you don't know me, my name is Josh Lofton. I'm the cropping system specialist uh, here at Oklahoma State. And it, it basically means that if it's not called wheat and it's not called cotton, I, I usually have a finger or a hand in it. So um, Brian asked me to kind of talk a little bit about soybean as he's done for the last couple years and, and talk a little bit about some of the work we've done in soybean planting and how to get that soybean crop off uh, on the right foot. So to kind of take a look at, at the state of soybeans in, in Oklahoma, if you will, uh, soybeans have always been kind of that staple crop. Uh, they've had their fit in a lot of our production systems. They've been pretty consistent over the last uh, you know, couple of decades, right around that 300 to 400,000 uh, acre mark. Once again, they fit into that system, but they have a lot of other crops that they can compete with on some of those more associated acres. So they've been kind of right around that, that mark, right around uh, this 2006, 2008 stage. We, we saw a little bit of dip in the market, so we saw a little bit of dip in our acres. Uh, right around here is where we saw those $16 soybean. If everybody remembers the dream of $16, $17 soybean, that's kind of where we saw that. Back into the drought, we had the, a couple of rough summers where we saw a really big decrease. But then up until recently, we've seen it kind of rally. Um, it's kind of really gained a whole lot of support and a whole lot of acres. One, because um, compared to some of our grain markets, the price of soybean is still okay. It's not great, it's not $16, we'd like it to be higher, but it's still okay compared to a lot of our grains. Uh, the other thing is in, with the advent or the uh, introduction of that new technology, soybean has been able to go into some acres that it previously was, was scared to go into, especially when we look at where this distribution has lied uh, in the last several years. So we look at our, our northeast production system. So that's when you look at that South Coffeyville, Miami, all the way down to the Coweta, Wagner, Bixby area. That's kind of where your northeast corridor is. That's our long-term soybean production system. So those are the guys that are gonna be running soybeans probably from here until the end of days. Um, soybean is just a part of the, the production system up there. They've been fairly consistent. We see a little bit of an increase in recent years, but overall have been, have been fairly consistent around that 125,000 mark. Even that East Central, so we're talking about down near Muskogee, Weber's Falls area, has been fairly consistent. The biggest growth we've got in the last several years is that North Central production system. So we're talking mainly K County. If you farm in K County, you've probably seen more soybeans than you probably have in a number of years. But we also pick up things in, in Garfield County, Major County, Woods County, Canadian County. All those are in that North Central region, uh, according to our NAS surveys, and that's where we've seen it. In addition, we've seen a big spike in previous years in that Southwest region. If you drive through those areas in Caddo County, your Apaches, Lawtons, you saw a lot more soybeans than probably you have historically. The last couple of years, cotton have kind of grabbed those back, uh, but we still expect, you know, depending on what the cotton market does in the next couple of years, to, to see growers play around with cotton soybeans in some form of rotation uh, kind of right around in there. So we see that we have a lot of new acres that we previously have not had, and, and some of our production practices that we've set in place many years ago might not translate out of that northeast corridor, that northeast district. And so when we, when we ask ourselves what's the problem with planting, it, it's fairly easy, right? Just putting seeds in the ground to where we have enough seed out there to grow something, that seems fairly straightforward. But the questions have been growing as far as all of our planting practices. And it's not solely uh, isolated to one case. We talk about row spacing, we talk about orientation, no-till, conventional till. What we're gonna focus on today is seeding rate because that's something that's been a big question of, of how much seed are we actually putting out there. That's not only an Oklahoma thing, that's not only a Southern Great Plains thing, but we're seeing that question be asked on a national basis pretty much over the last several years. If you Google soybean seeding rates, you probably see most of your land grain institutions have done some work over it in the last several years. We're, in, in times where commodity prices were high, seed costs were low, we didn't have this question because we were looking for that high input, high production system. We were okay spending a little extra money getting that extra bushel or two out at 10 to $15 uh, soybeans. However, things have shifted and a lot of our growers are looking to cut costs. And it's where we can cut costs in soybean are typically our two highest inputs. So those of you that, that manage or grow soybean, what do we have as our two biggest inputs? 
seed, because you know that's what we're talking about here today, and chemical. That's kind of where we're at, is we can cut seed or chemical because that's kind of our biggest input, and that's where the most of our money gets put. Well, you can't remove seeding, right? You, or else you don't have a crop, right? So we, we have to just ask from a seeding perspective, are we putting more out there than we need? Um, you know, that's a very valid question. And it all comes back to basics. So we go over this very similarly. This is something we go over in our introductory agronomy classes, but it's good to go back to the basics sometimes because the answer to seeding rate is very simple. It's not difficult, okay? So what we want to get a good yield is we want to have enough grain out there to get us a good, good appropriate yield. What do you have to have to have grain out there? You have to have plants. What do you have to do to have plants? You got to put seed in the ground, right? So like I said, it's, it's fairly simple, but it's this exchange right here from your planted seed to your actual plants at harvest to where things get a little bit tricky. Uh, and basically what you see in a lot of our Midwestern states, they've gone into saying that we aren't gonna have a variable rate recommendation. I've seen one from a very highly regarded soybean specialist in the, in the Midwest that just tells growers to plant a bag per acre. It's what you do, you know, because we have some flexibility. That, but that's in the Midwest. They're, they're very specific in their cropping system, usually soybean and corn. And basically, if you have more seed out there than you need, it's just you spend a little bit more up front. That's not how we are in Oklahoma. In a, in a moisture limiting situation, just putting enough out there and maybe throwing a little extra at the system just in case as a safety net, that's the wrong thing to do and, and we actually can pay dearly from it. So when we look at the planting puzzle, and I call it a puzzle because I couldn't fit more circles on the slide. Uh, because there's probably six or seven more circles that probably need to be up here on where we have to make a decision on seeding rate and seeding practices. But we look at things like planting date. What's our row spacing? What's our cropping system as far as a double crop system? As well as are we in that northeast corridor or are we over, over in our, our Woods County? That makes a big difference. Conditions at planting is, is also a big thing. And cultivar. Okay, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things going on here, and we could probably go over all of them, and, and we probably would be done around 5.30 this afternoon. But since Brian only gave me 30 minutes, we're not going to go over all of them. We're going to take two out because we haven't looked at them in, in too much detail, and that's being the row spacing and the conditions at planting. I can't really sim uh, you know, uh, make a, a synthesis of, of crusting at planting. I, I, I can't do something like that. We haven't really toyed around with 30 to 15 inch rows, so we're gonna take that out. But now we have these three little systems that we can look at and get a little bit better idea. One that I wanna kind of look at independently is cultivar, because there's a lot of disagreement around the countryside of how much influence cultivar has on how much seed you put into the ground. So when we talk about cultivars, we talk about varieties and soybeans, oftentimes they rotate and they change out from commercial acceptance in a very, very rapid pace. It and corn, usually you'll have a soybean on the market two, maybe three years. If, if you're a third year, you're considered old in soybean production. Especially with our new technology, we're seeing varieties on the market for a year, and, and that's it. So actually getting and testing individual soybean varieties is very difficult. It's very challenging, especially with this new genetics. So in soybean, oftentimes what we like to look at is our cultivar characteristics. So what is our cultivar doing out in the field? And if we look at how similar characteristics, usually we can make those management suggestions very similar between those. We look oftentimes when we go into seeding and seeding rate, how much it, based on the growth pattern. And our two that we're going to talk about is our bushy or our branching type soybean and an erect type soybean. So more your single stem nature. So if we look at those independently, this is all theoretical because once again, there's a lot of argument in the countryside. Our bushier beans, or our branching beans, they're, they're better if you give them chance to grow. Okay, so the question then becomes where does a branching or bushy type soybean put a majority of its, its pods? Is it on the main stem? 
No, they like to move them off the main stem. It, it's, it's a stress relief. It, it allows them to put pods on at various types of the year. Really likes to get that indeterminate growth nature in, in, in it. And we see that even in our determinate soybeans, we can get a lot of indeterminate nature out of our branches by putting more pods and seeds out on those branches when good conditions exist as opposed to when bad conditions exist. So you have to give those a little bit of space to breathe. When we talk about more of our erect cultivars, our single stem, most of that yield is going to come from that main stem. It likes to throw a lot of pods on a single node. It likes to throw everything it's got on that main node. Does that mean that it can't branch? No, it, it can branch just fine. But it likes to put a lot of its pods, probably over 80% of its pods like to go on that main stem. It likes to really tuck them in close. When we start talking about can or canopy architecture, uh, we talk about biomass at shading. This is when we often need more of these erect soybeans in a, in a per linear foot basis because it just doesn't have that uh, full branching potential. So when we, when we look and see what these look like, here's what you would typically look like in a single stem. Now, I've never seen a full single stem that has no branching potential whatsoever. I think there's some out there, they're like a unicorn, sometimes you think you see them off in the distance, but then when you get closer, it's got a couple branches on it. Oftentimes you see this uh, as, as, as our more indeterminate, kind of right halfway in between, and then a full branching. So if you look at that picture, which one would you rather put? I mean, look at all those pods on the branching one, right? I'd put a branch in soybeans out there eight days of the week, right? So there's only seven days in a week, by the way. So twice in seven, come on guys, come on. That's really not a good representation of it. It typically will put, given the, a good set of circumstances, it'll put on around about the same amount of pods. It's kind of where that likes to throw them. And so we, we see more of them out here on these branches, less on that main stem. We can get them be a little bit squattier, but that's also another characteristic they can breed into them. So when we talk about, is this, being, is this a marketing ploy? Branchiness versus erect soybean nature. Is it overstated? To a degree, all soybeans branch. So given the right conditions, the right uh, moisture, good spacing, everything will branch a little bit. But there's definitely difference between them, okay? So we definitely have a big difference between. But, I get a lot of growers ask me, well, I'm on 30s, can I decrease my row spacing and put a bushy one out there? It's not as simple as that. Uh, it, it likes to go out on more spacing, it likes a little bit more room to breathe, so would I put a branching soybean on seven and a half inch spacing at 100,000 seeds per acre? No, but that doesn't mean it's going to yield better on 30 inches. Okay, you need to fit what you're doing to this, not the other way around. So that's why I wanted to kind of talk about that independently, because there's a lot out in the countryside on marketing of branchiness versus erect soybean. It is a tool that we have to use, but we can't hang our hat solely on everything on whether it's a branchy or more erect soybean. So when we go back to that puzzle, we talked a little bit about cultivar. So now we're talking on two different things, planting date and more of our system-based approach. So what we wanted to do is kind of evaluate where, there we go. We wanted to evaluate where our optimum seeding rate was when we looked at different planting dates, and we looked at different planting regions. So what we did is we established trials in more of our traditional soybean growing region up in Miami, up in Ottawa County. Uh, one of our more dry region, this was a, a field just south of Perkins, okay? And then in our more high potential western system, this is in some of those river bottom grounds, and this was just south of Chickasha, okay? So three very distinct growing regions that we have here. We looked at planting rates from under 100,000 through 160,000, and we looked at three different planting dates, okay? So let's go to the results of these and kind of see what we have. So let me set this up for you. Right here we have the seeding rate. So we looked at 64,000, 96,000, 112,000, 128,000, 160,000 seeds planted per acre. Okay? Yield is along here on the y-axis. It's a little harder to see on this screen, so if you can see that one, it, it shows up a little bit better. 
but our blue line is from that Chickasha location. Our orange line, or kind of that, that almost a burgundy line here, is from Miami. And the gray or white line is from Perkins. Okay, so just to kind of set up, that's what we're going to look like over the next couple slides. I'm going to group these together because I told you we had three planning dates, but the planning dates were not the same at all locations because the systems are different. So what we have here is the early planning date. For our Chickasha and our Perkins location, this is going to be about the 20th of April. That's what we're going with on this early planting date. So that last full week in April is kind of what we're going with here. And these are both on 15 inch spacings. So keep that in mind. So what we see here is that 64,000 at Chickasha uh, and at Perkins, we have our lowest yield. We see a steady or incline at Chickasha up to about 96,000. And then we kind of flatten off until we get to around that 128,000. We put anything more on that, we're actually decreasing yield. Okay, Perkins locations, very similar. We get a, uh, our lowest here at that 64,000, a slight increase at 96. We actually cap out a little bit later at 112,000 seeds per acre. And then we start that, that general fall off till we get to 160. Okay, so very similar trends between these two. Miami, this is going to be your early plantings the first week of May. Okay, they're a different system out there. They plant a little bit later. And so something real early would be the first week in May. And this is on twins. So uh, you got 24 inch with a six, in, or a six inch in between twin rows. What we see is very similar. We have a slight increase at, until about 96,000, pretty much flattens out from there on. Okay, so early planting is pretty straightforward. Okay, just don't go over 96 on some of our systems. Some of our other ones can handle a little bit more. Let's look as we, as we shift this planting to late. And this is where we think, see things kind of shake out a little bit more. This right here, this late planting for our Chick Shane, our Perkins location, this is gonna be mid-May. So we're talking outside of our recommended planting window. So with the Chick Shane location, once again, we had an increase to about 96,000, and then we had a significant fall off quite rapidly. Our lowest, uh, our lowest yield is actually where you put out the most seed, okay? So we get pretty low yields when we put too much out there. Perkins, very similar to early. We get a slight increase until we get to 112, and once again, we fall off, okay? So at Miami, very similar, a slight increase to 96, kind of flatten off. We actually had an anomaly out here at 160, significantly increased yields out there. Don't know what that's from. We looked at it, everything looks normal on in-season data. Uh, I don't expect to see that in most years, but, but we did see it this year. So if we look at our full season production, which is what these two slides would be kind of uh, summarizing, why do we think we have that fall off, of course, at, at higher seed rates? Absolutely, so we get more biomass out there Right, more biomass needs more moisture. When you get these hot, dry Julys and August, you're eventually gonna fall off. Okay, so who knows these two systems, Chickasha and Perkins? So the question becomes, why do we need more seeds at Perkins than we do at Chickasha? Anybody? What was that? It actually was a little bit with the water holding capacity, but it's not exactly what you think. We actually have better water holding capacity, better soil moisture at Chickasha. So what happened early in the season? If I have good water, good temperatures, what does soybean like to do? It likes to grow like gangbusters, right? What happens when you get a bush of soybean that's about that big and you can barely reach around it because it's like a Christmas tree when July hits and we don't get any rain? It just falls flat on its face. Okay, so even though that was the best looking soybeans we had in the whole trial, because we knew we had that July temperatures coming, we knew we had those issues, we actually see that it needs lower amount. Perkins is smaller. It's that sandier soil. If anybody's gone down to Perkins, that whole region down in South Payne County, really sandy soils, not a whole lot of water holding capacity. So even really good conditions really restrict that soybean growth. Doesn't have a whole lot of growth, so we need a little bit more out there. 
So when we go to our last planting date, so we're talking about real late planting, i.e. maybe a replant situation, or you're talking about double crop production. Both, all of these are in that mid-June situation. All of these follow the same general trend. We get a sharp increase until about 112,000, and then we kind of flatten out from there. So we see that this benefit of adding a little extra seed in Chickasha and Miami location, about the same amount of seed we would need at the Perkins location. So why do we go with that? What do we know about double crop soybean production that we, that we typically need more seeds out there? It's shorter season, so it's smaller usually in stature. So we don't have kind of that growth to kind of hold on to. And so we just need more seeds out there to get, get the ground covered, right? So we can use this data and, and get us exactly what we need, right? You know all the seeding rate that you need no matter where you are in Oklahoma from this set of data, right? Is it all about how much seed I put out there? It's never about how much seed I put out there. Ever. Ever. Okay? What's it about? How many plants you have out there? So what, if, if I were to ask what a critical threshold for plants per acre in Oklahoma would be, what would somebody say? Does anybody know what our current recommendation is? Us and Kansas. I wish it was 80,000. 100,000. So we need 100,000 seeds out there to make a crop. That's just kind of not what this data has shown. So when you actually look at actual population, when you actually go across the board, right around that 80,000, which I said, I wish it was that 80,000. Maybe it can be now. That 80,000 is kind of right where we see, but we see it does encapsulate that 100,000, depending on what your production system basis is, we see that go all the way to that 125,000 seeds per acre. So we have that gap of that's how many plants we need out there per acre. Okay? So that can help us with our planting schemes, that can help us with everything out, as well as that can help us when we plant a lot out there and we have some stand loss, right? Because that's a big issue. So when we talk about a good, a good production system, what would we typically estimate how much emergence you get when you plant out there? So let's walk backwards. So we need to know how much seed we're gonna put in the drill. How much seed are we gonna put in the drill? What's your emergence? Well, actually, Doug Shoup, which, is, which was the uh, Southeast Area Agronomist at Kansas State, did a little trial. And what they found is that indifferent of how many seeds per acre you put out there, you got about 80% stand establishment. Okay, so that's, that's a good thing that we can kind of bang or kind of hang our hat on is that around that 80,000. So 80,000 is where we need to go, right? If you, if you were planting, you're shooting for 80,000, or if you're shooting a little bit high, you have bad, bad germination, bad stand, stand establishment, maybe you get a good pounding rain, 80,000 is exactly where we need to go, right? Best case scenario, probably close. However, when we look at things like uniformity, this is a big issue because uniform stands are a lot more flexible than skippy stands. We've all seen skippy stands. If you didn't see skippy stands this year, you didn't visit a soybean stand this year. Okay, we had skippy stands really bad. And so we start asking ourselves is, is where is our critical threshold if we have good uniform stands? Around that 80,000 is probably right about where we need to be. You know, we have some flexibility on either side when you start adding other components in. But if you start looking at skippy or gappy stands, we probably need that 100 to 110,000 seeds out there to kind of make up for those gaps we have uh, in those stands. So it's a lot different. And this is why we say that there's a lot of information going on. There's a lot, of, there's a lot more to it than just how much seed I need to throw into the planter because there's a lot of information going here. But if you kind of shoot for that 80,000, you're gonna be okay. But that's agronomically, right? Does it ever come down to agronomics? Does it ever come down to agronomics? No, it's all about dollars and cents, right? Agronomics is just that next step down the line. So if we look at our dollars and cents and, and go into economics, generally, when we look at the economics solely of planting, we found that they did follow agronomics fairly, 
fairly similarly. Something that was significant might not be a good uh, return on investment, so to say, but generally speaking, our economics followed the same trends that our agronomics did, with one exception. You remember that anomaly I talked about, where we had that 160 that was really good stands out in Miami? This is where we start to kind of look at it. So what we have here is our planting date, our seeding rate, seeding cost at $46 for 140,000 seeds per, per bag, right? So that's kind of your standard seeding cost nowadays with those extend Roundup Readies. I got it from a couple seed dealers. They, they promised me it was about right, right? And then we got our high value production. So around that $63, you know, that high end seed cost. So we look at our seed, our seed costs uh, here across the board. So we look at revenue here. This is if we have $8 a bushel, kind of around where we are right now, if you want to give or take. And this is back in our glory days, that $10 a bushel. So now we can start figuring out dollars and cents wise, what actually came out. And we go to that anomaly. So if we go to that, that 160 planting, uh, and we kind of look at where everything else kind of fell out at that 90,000 seeds per acre. When we go here, we're only getting $7 an acre. We actually get a pretty steep increase here, but we're getting actually a negative there. And we're getting once again, you know, a $6 increase from a potential to get that, that extra yield at 160,000. So the question then becomes, is it, is it worth it? Well, so let's, let's go kind of what we gleaned from it. There's a lot of evidence and, and pretty much universally showing that we're probably putting too much seed out there per acre. That old time of putting a bag of seed per acre, that probably should have never happened, okay? We're probably more along the lines of 120 to you know 80,000 seeds per acre is probably a good, good thing to shoot for depending on your, your system. 90% of our yields were achieved in between that, that 80,000, 100,000, or 120 plants per acre. That's what we need to shoot for as final population. Depending on your system, our mortality ranged from about 85 to 75% with higher in our double crop. Our seed mortality from the time we planted the seed until the final stands at harvest were a lot lower in our double crop, our late planting. That has to be expected, okay? Remember that areas that have greater plant mortality are going to need higher seeds. It's cost of doing business. Okay, that's, that's almost universally accepted. It, it's not maybe the most economic thing, but agronomically that's the best thing. So the, the, the whole question then is, what do we need to do if we move back to high grossing soybeans? Do we need to increase our seeding rates back up? Oh, if soybeans get to be $16 an acre again, guess what our seeding rate should be? Same. Okay, where do we put that money? Either put it back in your pocket or manage stink bugs better. Manage your diseases better. Get a better fertility program. This is where we're gonna get our better return on investment on soybeans. Our stands are gonna be good. Our seeding rate needs to be good and consistent no matter what the commodity price is. Okay, that needs to be almost a good standard. This is just for yield. So the question becomes, do you ever plant more seeds than is agronomically beneficial? It's a trick question. Okay, so we have focused on yield. Where else can you gain it? Anywhere else can you gain benefit of high seeding populations? If you're a seed dealer, that's a good, that's a good answer. Yeah, throw 200,000 seeds out there. It, it works fine. It works fine. Yeah, so we, we have that irrigated system. I do think that we, if we have 120,000 seeds per, per, heck, or per acre and we have the right variety out there, I think that's still going to hit us pretty good. Well, I tell you, one of these was actually irrigated, and we still got 120 was kind of where it was. Um, but, but 
the benefits of branching kind of go out there to where if I have a little extra spacing that I can put out there and I do have that irrigated high input system, that's where those branching soybeans can actually help you. Let that, let that soybean variety help you. We'll get there. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Say that again in here in about two minutes. That's, that's an excellent point. The first one I want to say is weed management. Okay? We looked at weed control and our best weed control without the use of herbicide. I have to state that without the use of herbicide was always the plant population higher than what our economic return was. Okay? Without the use of herbicide. Okay, so if you have somebody that doesn't like to use herbicide or likes to throw Roundup out there or Roundup, re or Roundup resistant weeds, plant population is one way that we can actually get there. Okay, it can help. Then what did you say again? Say it back again. Pod height, excellent. Double crop, I tell you, the best thing to do to get that pod height is to throw more beans at it. But what's another good way to do it? Maturity is okay. I'm thinking something else. It's more brown in a double crop situation. Good tall residue will do the same thing. Okay? What we want to do is if we have any population, even in our full, full, full production system, to where that pond's lower than four inches, that's almost universally considered unobtainable. So if you're throwing a lot of low pods, maybe that is one of those situations where you need to throw a little bit more seed out there. But low potting is a thing, especially in your short systems, so your double crop systems, because of the lower amount of growth, they'll want to start putting a flower out at that first node. And that will typically be under four inches. So if we have that kind of system where we start noding and flowering really short, we probably need to throw something else out there. But then the question becomes, is losing one node worth the potential fall off that we have on throwing extra seed out there? That, that's a catch, and that's gonna have to be on a system by system basis, okay? So with that, I can answer any questions. We, we definitely are there at the break, so we can continue this discussion at the break. I do have to thank one, the Oklahoma Soybean Board, which this was a partial funding for. I do have to thank them for all their support. There's ways to kind of contact me. And once again, if you have any questions. Definitely, my, my predecessor always said, if you're on July 4th, you should have your seed sold back. Um, that should never be a, a, a thing. I've seen July planted soybeans usually never work out. Um, I'm more along that lines of once you're about mid-20s, so about 20, 25th of June, you're, you're probably too late. Um, we see some heads shaking. What do you guys like? After July the 4th, are we planning the 15th of July? You guys have done okay? Well, and it's going to depend on the year. What? Though they were saying that they planted mid July and got pretty good beans. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's really going to depend on your system. And if you, if you, if you want to go after, just be ready for those inputs. I mean, you're gonna to need to make sure that you're, you're bringing that crop along. You know, I've, I've, I've grown soybeans in Louisiana and we've worked with the folks in Arkansas and I've grown them here. And I've seen growers here in the state plant a lot less and get a 100 bushel. Um, we don't need it, once again. It's, it's one of those kind of things that if you need in those Midwestern states, the Missouri and Kentucky and all that, to where you have that weather that can support that much biomass, you know, maybe you can push over that 100 when you don't normally do that with that. If you do that here and we turn off really hot and dry, that safety net's gonna, gonna wrap you up and, and kind of put you in a ball, is what I've seen. I, I, I've seen more benefit out of going into your fungicides, your insecticides, good weed management program, good fertility program. That's probably where the, the money needs to get put in extra. Mm -hmm.